as you're reading through the first chapter in your textbook, you'll see several of the philosophers listed. So psychology derived from philo uh, philosophy. So Socrates is the ancient Greek philosopher. Um, he's largely accredited as the founder of Western philosophy. And he developed a philosophical disposition at a young age uh, and would do the most annoying things of walk around and asking questions of complete strangers. He'd humbly ask a question, attempt to engage, and then see if he, uh, if each could be left any more wiser for having had the discussion. His aim, though, was to look for a systematic rationale, which enlivens the way we talk about an idea, like what makes it so valued, why is it so esteemed. Uh, <clears throat> the search for wisdom and truth lied in the activity of dialogue. It was in the asking or the seeking and the engagement that one would come to know their true beliefs and to get to the heart of the matter on problems that plagued the soul. And investigating conversational attitude makes it possible to bring up implied opinions and then question the validity of those views. So he believed, uh, or he revealed that in discussing and analyzing an idea, the very nature of the concept would reveal itself. Uh, so philosophy, with philosophy and Socrates, um, he is, uh, remains to be the greatest teacher that the world has ever known. Uh, philosophy may be in, in wonder, but it moves through doubt and it arrives with not always knowing, but the process makes all the difference. And the journey can sometimes be the answer after all. So Plato was a student of Socrates. Uh, he, uh, in his question, how we know what we know, the underlying fundamental question is relationship to the human psyche. As individuals, how do we really know what to know? For example, if you don't understand how to tune a musical instrument, you'll have to ask fundamental questions in order to understand how to tune a musical instrument. As in the human psyche, Plato asks the same question in order to stand, understand the concept and how people know. Psyche is based on the theory of justice that has six fundamental aspects, such as faculties, principles, activities, aspects, instances, and levels. Their nature and role have been characterized in ways uh, influenced as much perhaps by the connotations of these terms as by the details of Plato's text. Subsequently, psychology has been developed from the origins of the early philosophers, such as Plato, uh, which, uh, who is an, uh, a Greek philosopher that believed uh, people were born with a blank slate at birth, which can be changed into anything through their life, depending on the influence of surroundings. In his quest of the true essence of the human psyche, as well as the pursuit of the maintenance soul, he philo uh, philosophized through the teachings of Socrates within various concepts, such as looking at metaphysics or what we call uh, platonic realism. His uh, second ph philosophical concept has influenced modern psychology, uh, which is the theory of forms. It's Plato's belief that the material world, as it seems to us, is not the real world but it's only a shadow of the real world. Past philosophers believe that we are born into a world of ignorance and that we cannot truly see the meaning, what truly is. And we see this in the allegory of the cave from the philosophers. Uh, as a result it, from the allegory of the cave, Plato shows that the mind influences perception that has greatly influenced Western psychologists such as Freud, as well as Carl Jung. Uh, Carl Jung goes on to discuss the collective unconscious and these uh, align very closely with uh, ideas from Plato and his early work. So Aristotle is Plato's prize student, um, and he had this philosophical empiricism belief 
which is that all knowledge is acquired through experience. If we define psychology as a formal study of the mind and a more systematic approach to understanding and curing mental conditions, then the ancient Greeks, you know, have the leading proponent, proponents in theory. But as with many scientific studies, Aristotle was at the forefront of developing the foundations of the history of psychology. Aristotle's psychology was intertwined with his philosophy of the mind, reasoning, as well as ethics, but the psychological method started with his brilliant mind as well as his empirical approach. Uh, but it would be unfair to concentrate fully on Aristotle's psychology without studying some of the other great thinkers like we've talked about with uh, Plato and, and Socrates as well. Uh, Aristotle, Aristotle built upon the work of earlier philosophers. Uh, he uh, wrote this first known text in the history of psychology called Parapsyche, which is about the mind. So he laid out the first tenets of studying of reasoning, and this kind of determined the direction of the history of psychology. Uh, in the book, the definition of psyche was as common at the time was used as mind and soul interchangeably with the ancient Greek philosophers, feeling no need to make a distinction between the two. Uh, in Parapsyche, Aristotle's psychology proposed that the mind was the first um, or primary reason for existence and functioning of the body. This line of thought was heavily influenced by Aristotle's zoology where he proposed that there were three types of souls defining life, the plant soul, the animal soul, and the human soul. This gave humanity the unique ability to reason and create. He was one of the first minds to examine the urges and impulse that drove and defined life, uh, believing that the libido, as well as the urge to reproduce, was the overriding impulse of all living things, which was influenced by the plant soul. Uh, he partially linked this process of achieving immortality and fulfilling the purposes of a divine mind. He proposed this re uh, reproductive urge many centuries before Darwin. Um, so this is you know, an example of one of the great intuitive mental leaps that define Aristotle and his legacy. Uh, he also understood the importance of time on the actions of driving a person with desire concerned with the present and reason, more concerned with the future and long-term consequences. So he, he focused a lot on what drives human behavior. And so we see uh, B.F. Skinner as well as Ivan Pavlov are another couple names in here that kind of derived their work based off of what Aristotle did. So Descartes, Another philosopher, French philosopher, uh, was known as the father of modern philosophy as well as the father of modern mathematics. He ranks as one of the most important and influential thinkers of modern times. His writings have been closely studied uh, from his time down to present day. He is one of the key thinkers of the scientific revolution of the Western world. Uh, he is frequently contrasted his views with uh, those of his predecessors. Um, it's, uh, he, he focused a lot on math. He studied, uh, he invented the uh, Cartesian coordinate system, which is what we use in geometry as well as in algebra. Um, in his natural philosophy, he differs from the schools on two major points. He rejects the idea, the analysis of corporal substance into matter and form, and then he also rejects any appeal to ends, such as divine or natural, in explaining natural uh, phenomena. He insists on the absolute freedom of God's act of creation as part of his theory. And he has, he's known uh, for that famous statement, I think, therefore I am. That was done by uh, Descartes as well. But centuries later, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, uh, this is in 1949, argued that Descartes was wrong 
and that there's no ghost in the machine and that all mental activity is simply the result of the physical activity of the brain. Most of your modern psych uh, scientists reject Descartes' dualism uh, and they embrace Ryle's more scientific materialism theory. So you can see based on their dates, uh, Wilhelm Wundt as well as William James practiced around the same time. In 1879, Boont assisted his first graduate student at a true psychological research, which is another milestone in psychology. Uh, he was known to everyone as being a quiet, hardworking, uh, very methodol uh, methodological researcher. He's a very good lecturer. Uh, the studies that he conducted and his now numerous students were mostly on sensation and perception. Um, he is known for this whole idea of structuralism. Uh, he felt that, you know, every physical event has a mental counterpart and every mental event has a physical counterpart. He talked a lot about consciousness, which is the person's subjective experience of the world and the mind. Um, he's known for introspection, uh, which is the structure of the human mind or a subjective observation of one's own experience. But he is known for opening the first psychological laboratory and had the first graduate students in there. William James, on the other hand, was the functionalism side. Um, so he was the first to take this scientific approach to studying psychology. He wrote The Principles of Psychology. His main idea with functionalism is to study, it's the study of the purpose or mental processes which serve in a, uh, enabling people to adapt to their environment. Uh, so Wundt is, Wundt is more of the, uh, you know, the, the structure, the hardware to our bodies and our minds and how they interact together versus James is more trying to understand the, the functional side and you know, why we do what we do. Uh, but he is also known to have suffered from depression in his life as well. Titchener is another early psychologist. Um, he did a lot of research on Boone's method of introspection to uh, conduct his theory. He was very interested in studying the systematic psychology. Um, <clears throat> He studied under Wundt. He focused on ident identifying basic elements of the mind. Uh, he was not the first to try to identify the elements of conscious experiments. Um, so he uh, looked at more of the, the core context or theory of meaning, you know, getting at the core of what the mental processes is, as well as uh, trying to understand the unconscious context that's associated with the core of our mental process. So we have a couple of women here early on in psychology, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, Calkins in the in 1890, she taught she taught psychology at Wesley. Uh, so she advanced pretty quickly. She became a professor of philosophy and psychology in 1989. Uh, she also helped to establish the earliest laboratories for experimental psychologies uh, in the country and the first in a women's college as well. Her own work in the field dealt primarily with such topics as space and time consciousness, emotion, association, color theory, and dreams. Her theory of self-psychology uh, was in contrast to the behaviorist view uh, when in the uh, conscious self is a central fact of psychology. And then with Margaret uh, Floyd Washburn, she uh, wrote a couple of books um, from the series of studies from the Psychological Laboratory of Vassar College. Her own publications include sources of articles, reviews, notes, and professional journals. She did uh, The Animal Mind in 1908 and The Movement and mental in imagery in 1916. Uh, she uh, had this development of dualistic motor theory of mental activity, and this was an attempt to find a compromise between the opposed and equally one-sided schools 
that were going on at the time of behaviorism as well as introspection. She also served as a cooperating editor of the American Journal of Psychology, and uh, she was one of the four co-editors from 1925. So Kenneth Clark studied the developmental effects of prejudice, discrimination, and segregation on children. In one classic study from the 50s, he found that African-American preschoolers preferred white dolls to black one. Clark's research was cited by the U.S. Supreme Court in its decision uh, of the Brown versus Board of Education that ended school segregation. Um, so we'll look at the, the doll study that Clark did in uh, the social psychology chapter. Uh, there's some information on that. Uh, and then a little bit more about Calkins here. She was the first woman elected APA president. Um, she suffered a lot of sex discrimination during her lifetime due to being you know, a woman working in the field. Uh, despite academic setbacks, uh, such as Harvard University refusing to grant women an official PhD, uh, she still you know, was very successful and distinguished in her career as well as research and teaching at, at Wesley College. So, and then, oops, uh, Frances Cecil Sumner is known as being the first uh, African American that was awarded uh, a PhD in psychology. Uh, so that that's his, what we most think of when we see him um, he's commonly referred to as the father of black psychology. Um, he worked a lot with Stanley Hall, uh, on, um, during his time at Clark University. Uh, he did graduate as valedictorian from Lincoln College. Uh, he was main area of focus in his career was how to refute racism and bias in the theories, which is used to conclude the inferiority of African American uh, Americans. But Sumner's work is thought to be a response to the Eurocentric methods of psychology. So he did work for Wilberforce University in 1920. He was a professor of psychology and philosophy. He went on to teach at Southern University in Louisiana. He then accepted after that a uh, position at West Virginia uh, Collegiate Institute. He wrote a lot of articles dealing with the state of colleges and acceptance of African Americans, or rather the lack thereof at the time. So this really helped to raise awareness uh, for the views that were brought up by Booker T. Washington as well as Dubois. So he remained for the next seven years pretty active. Um, over time, he did fail to receive funding for his research. He claimed that race prejudice was the cause of his inability to attain his and other African-American scientists funding. He did serve on the chair as a chair of the psychology department at Howard University. Uh, so most of his, re you know, most of his career was spent, you know, in the classroom, educating as well as trying to improve and get equal rights for African-American students. So these three focused a lot on the brain. Franz Joseph Gall is best known for phrenology, which has since been kind of debunked and considered to be a pseudoscience at this point. Um, but if you study like the, the bumps on the brain, uh, which you can kind of see in this image here, he stated that um, the different areas of the brain based on the bumps and things on the head uh, is how he figured out where different things were. But you can see like underneath the eye here, he has language. Well, there's nothing underneath the eye. It's just, you know, it's just your, your eye socket or your cheekbone. Um, so he, it, over time, his theory was, was debunked. Um, and part of that is due to Pierre Florenz. So he surgically removed brain pieces, which argued against Gull's methods. Uh, and, you know, when certain pieces of the brain were removed, uh, didn't match up with the part of the brain that Gull thought we had. And then Paul Broca, uh, we talk about the Wernicke's and the Broca area in the brain. And so he <clears throat> studied brain damage patients and linked this to uh, 
motor motor speech is what we found. So we call the Broca's area of the brain as a result of his work for motor speech. So you can see from our image of the brain here, you know, he had a, a patient and when this person died, he dissected the brain. So when he found this left lesion of the hemisphere, that is why he was able to conclude that this had been responsible for his patient's loss of speech. Uh, so it also, you know, kind of debunked some of the other theories and ideas that were out there. Um, his client was nicknamed Tan because that's the only word that he could say. So Leborgan's brain here that you see in the jar lives in a museum in Paris, France. Um, and nobody knows what his first name is to this day. So we just know him as Mr. Leborgan or Tan. So Charles Darwin is probably a name that you're more familiar with. Um, he hypothesized and theorized many things, some parts of his research more, more salient to psychology than other aspects. But he wrote that humans and animals were descended from a common ancestor. Uh, this would develop into research into the 1900s as well as the 2000s, showing that humans and animals share the majority of their genes. And because Darwin stated that humans and animals have a lot in common, the field of comparative psychology, like studying animals to learn about human behavior, increased in popularity. Scientists had studied animals for thousands of years and made inferences about humans from those animals, but Darwin's theories led to researchers making inferences about human behaviors, such as learning, memory, emotions, and even social interactions, based on observations and experiments with animals. His research uh, also led to further research in psychology of individual differences. Uh, before his theories, most researchers were trying to understand humans by looking at averages as well as similarities between people. They were just trying to understand the basic underlying constructs of human behavior. But after Darwin, psychologists began investigating individual differences. Uh, it was not many years after before the first modern intelligence test was developed by Binet in France. Uh, and intelligence is one area where many researchers focus on individual differences. Some psychologists are interested in what human traits make some people more, why they make some people more successful than others. Uh, this is largely based on Darwin's idea of natural selection, where the strongest or adaptive or creative species survive and others do not. Um, so psychology today has strong biological underpinnings as, relate to, as we relate it back largely to Darwin's work. Psychologists often try to explain psychological concepts in light of biological processes. Um, some of the schools of psychology are strictly Darwinian, such as the ethological psychology and evolutionary psychology. So he's left quite an impact on the field. We really study psychology in three parts. We look at the biological, right, which is the nature side to things, the genes, genetic makeup, DNA, things like that. We study the psychological influences, or sometimes it's referred to as like the cognitive ability, which is the ideas of the mind, and then the sociocultural influences, which is the relationships that we have between other people. So if you're interested in getting into this field, you know, there, it breaks it down into different types of professions or, or jobs that you could have in the field. So counselors, um, therapists, social workers, I mean, they kind of all do the same thing. Um, you can see counselors, both individual as well as group therapy, one-on-one, um, -on -one, you know, uh, therapy with people. Uh, the, I don't know, the counselors, I think, have more of a broad role. Um, they sometimes act as liaisons or resources to people in the community. Um, social workers primarily do therapy more often on a regular basis. Um, but if you're looking to going into the field, you really have to think like what area you want to be in. You know, counselors, we have school counselors, we have career counselors, we have life coaches that come from that. Um, social work primarily is just that. It's, you know, therapy that you do as, you know, individual as well as group therapy. Um, clinical psychologists are, you have to have a, a, a type 73 
degree. So you have to get a master's if you want to be a clinical psychologist um, or a school psychologist um, would have a type 73. And so primarily they perform testing. They, they do a lot of research too, especially if you're at a university. Um, but they'll, you know, like your kid is in school and they need an IEP. So the school psychologist will run a battery of tests and help determine what services would best suit this child. Um, and then the psychiatrist is your medical doctor. So they're the only ones right now that are allowed to prescribe medication, which if you have any desire to go to medical school, we have such a shortage of psychiatrists. This is one area that we really need more help in. Um, anybody that's tried to get an appointment with a psychiatrist knows it's at least a 30 day wait, sometimes even longer than that. But what if the person is suffering and they really need to get on medication now? You know, what are we supposed to do with them while they wait the 30 days to get that appointment? And God forbid they miss that appointment for whatever reason, because people that need the medication aren't always great at remembering appointments and getting to things on time and, you know, just kind of doing some of the daily tasks that can be a very much a hassle uh, in our lives. But, you know, we, we, we really struggle in this area uh, to get people to the medication sometimes or keep these appointments that with the psychiatrist they're just so overbooked so if you have any desire to go to medical school that is one area where we desperately desperately need help so there's so many different career paths that you can take in this area in this field you know psychologists are drawn to many different subfields in here um, sometimes people with a degree in psychology might end up as a dolphin trainer at Brookfield Zoo, you know, which is here in the Chicago area, if you're not from around here. Um, you know, so there's so many different areas that you can work in. You can do crisis intervention. You can work in hospitals. You can do private practice. Um, you could be, you know, like work with DCFS. Um, you could work in the, like the community crisis centers. You could work with your uh, substance users. Um, you could work in the prison system. You could work in the youth correctional. You could work in ju uh, juvenile area. Um, so there's, there's just so many, so many areas that you could go into. Um, <clears throat> clinical psychology in general makes up about half of the doctorates that are awarded in psychology. So I didn't have to do a clinical PhD, which is why I have a philosophy in general psychology for a PhD, but that's because my master's degree in human services um, allows me to have the clinical side. So, you know, you would start with your LPC and then you could sit for your LCPC once you get enough hours in the field. So I, I have enough hours. Um, to sit for my LCPC, should I so choose, which would then allow me to do private practice. But uh, as I might have mentioned in my introduction video, I like you guys, right? <laughs> I like you guys. So <laughs> I, I haven't really been that motivated to sit for my LCPC and do private practice because I like being in the classroom and I like teaching. So, <clears throat> so many avenues right, that you could take with a, a degree in psychology or human services or, or social work or any of that. 